Chapter Two of Best Russian Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Best Russian Short Stories, edited and compiled by Thomas Seltzer. The Queen of Spades by Alexander Pushkin. Part Two. Four. Lizaveta Ivanovna was sitting in her room, still in her ball dress, lost in deep thought. On returning home she had hastily dismissed the chambermaid, who very reluctantly came forward to assist her, saying that she would undress herself, and with a trembling heart had gone up to her own room, expecting to find Herman there, but yet hoping not to find him. At the first glance she convinced herself that he was not there, and she thanked her fate for having prevented him keeping the appointment. She sat down without undressing, and began to recall to mind all the circumstances which in so short a time had carried her so far. It was not three weeks since the time when she first saw the young officer from the window, and yet she was already in correspondence with him, and he had succeeded in inducing her to grant him a nocturnal interview. She knew his name only through his having written it at the bottom of some letters. She had never spoken to him, had never heard his voice, and had never heard him spoken of until that evening. But strange to say, that very evening at the ball, Tomsky, being piqued with the young princess Pauline N., who, contrary to her usual custom, did not flirt with him, wished to revenge himself by assuming an air of indifference he therefore engaged lizaveta ivanovna and danced an endless mazurka with her during the whole time he kept teasing her about her partiality for engineer officers he assured her that he knew far more than she imagined and some of his jests were so happily aimed that lizaveta thought several times that her secret was known to him from whom have you learned all this she asked smiling from a friend of a person very well known to you replied tomsky from a very distinguished man and who is this distinguished man his name is herman lizaveta made no reply but her hands and feet lost all sense of feeling this herman continued tomsky is a man of romantic personality he has the profile of a napoleon and the soul of a mephistopheles i believe that he has at least three crimes upon his conscience how pale you've become i have a headache but what did this herman or whatever his name is tell you herman is very much dissatisfied with his friend he says that in his place he would act very differently i even think that herman himself has designs upon you at least he listens very attentively to all that his friend has to say about you and where has he seen me in church perhaps or on the parade god alone knows where it may have been in your room while you were asleep for there's nothing that he three ladies approaching him with the question oublez ou regret interrupted the conversation which had become so tantalizingly interesting to lizaveta the lady chosen by tomsky was the princess pauline herself she succeeded in effecting a reconciliation with him during the numerous turns of the dance after which he conducted her to a chair on returning to his place tomsky thought no more either of herman or lizaveta she longed to renew the interrupted conversation but the mazurka came to an end and shortly afterwards the old countess took her departure tomsky's words were nothing more than the customary small talk of the dance but they sank deep into the soul of the young dreamer the portrait sketched by tomsky coincided with the picture she had formed within her own mind and thanks to the latest romances the ordinary countenance of her admirer became invested with attributes capable of alarming her and fascinating her imagination at the same time she was now sitting with her bare arms crossed and with her head still adorned with flowers sunk upon her uncovered bosom suddenly the door opened and herman entered she shuddered where were you she asked in a terrified whisper in the old countess's bedroom replied herman i have just left her the countess is dead my god what do you say and i am afraid added herman that i am the cause of her death lizaveta looked at him and tomsky's words found an echo in her soul this man has at least three crimes upon his conscience herman sat down by the window near her and related all that had happened lizaveta listened to him in terror so all these passionate letters those ardent desires this bold obstinate pursuit all this was not love money that was what his soul yearned for she could not satisfy his desire and make him happy the poor girl had been nothing but the blind tool of a robber of the murderer or her aged benefactress she wept bitter tears of agonized repentance herman gazed at her in silence his heart too was a prey to violent emotion but neither the tears of the poor girl nor the wonderful charm of her beauty enhanced by her grief could produce any impression upon his hardened soul he felt no pricking of conscience at the thought of the dead old woman one thing only grieved him the irreparable loss of the secret from which he had expected to obtain great wealth you are a monster said lizaveta at last i did not wish for her death replied herman my pistol was not loaded both remained silent the day began to dawn lizaveta extinguished her candle a pale light illumined her room 
she wiped her tear-stained eyes and raised them towards herman he was sitting near the window with his arm crossed and a fierce frown upon his forehead in this attitude he bore a striking resemblance to the portrait of napoleon this resemblance struck lizaveta even how shall i get you out of the house said she at last i thought of conducting you down the secret staircase but in that case it would be necessary to go through the countess's bedroom and i'm afraid tell me how to find this secret staircase i'll go along lizaveta arose took from her drawer a key handed it to herman and gave him the necessary instructions herman pressed her cold limp hand kissed her bowed head and left the room he descended the winding staircase and once more entered the countess's bedroom the dead old lady sat as if petrified her face expressed profound tranquillity herman stopped before her and gazed long and earnestly at her as if he wished to convince himself of the terrible reality at last he entered the cabinet felt behind the tapestry for the door and then began to descend the dark staircase filled with strange emotions down this very staircase thought he perhaps coming from the very same room and at this very same hour sixty years ago there may have glided in an embroidered coat with his hair dressed a loiseau royal and pressing to his heart his three-cornered hat some young gallant who has long been mouldering in the grave but the heart of his aged mistress had only to-day ceased to beat at the bottom of this staircase herman found a door which he opened with a key and then traversed a corridor which conducted him into the street five three days after the fatal night at nine o'clock in the morning herman repaired to the convent of where the last honours were to be paid to the mortal remains of the old countess although feeling no remorse he could not altogether stifle the voice of conscience which said to him you are the murderer of an old woman in spite of his entertaining very little religious belief he was exceedingly superstitious and believing that the dead countess might exercise an evil influence on his life he resolved to be present at her obsequies in order to implore her pardon the church was full it was with difficulty that herman made his way through the crowd the coffin was placed upon a rich catafalque beneath a velvet baldachin the deceased countess lay within it with her hands crossed upon her breast with a lace cap upon her head and dressed in a white satin robe above the catafalque stood the members of the household the servants and black captains with armorial ribbons upon their shoulders and candles in their hands the relatives children grandchildren and great-grandchildren in deep mourning nobody wept tears would have been un affectation the countess was so old that her death could have surprised nobody and her relatives had long looked upon her as being out of the world a famous preacher pronounced the funeral sermon in simple and touching words he described the peaceful passing away of the righteous who had passed long years in calm preparation for a christian end the angel of death found her said the orator engaged in pious meditation and waiting for the midnight bridegroom the service concluded amidst profound silence the relatives went first to take farewell of the corpse then followed the numerous guests who had come to render the last homage to her who for so many years had been a participator in their frivolous amusements after these followed the members of the countess's household the last of these was an old woman of the same age as the deceased two young women led her forward by the hand she had not the strength enough to bow down to the ground she merely shed a few tears and kissed the cold hand of the mistress herman now resolved to approach the coffin he knelt down upon the cold stones and remained in that position for some minutes at last he arose as pale as the deceased countess herself he ascended the steps of the catafalque and bent over the corpse at that moment it seemed to him that the dead woman darted a mocking look at him and winked with one eye herman started back took a false step and fell to the ground several persons hurried forward and raised him up at that same moment lizaveta ivanovna was borne fainting into the porch of the church this episode disturbed for some minutes the solemnity of the gloomy ceremony among the congregation arose a deep murmur and a tall thin chamberlain a near relative of the deceased whispered in the ear of an englishman who was standing near him that the young officer was a natural son of the countess to which the englishman coldly replied oh during the whole of that day herman was strangely excited repairing to an out-of-the-way restaurant to dine he drank a great deal of wine contrary to his usual custom in the hope of deadening his inward agitation but the wine only served to excite his imagination still more on returning home he threw himself upon his bed without undressing and fell into a deep sleep when he woke up it was already night and the moon was shining into the room he looked at his watch it was quarter to three sleep had left him he sat down upon his bed and thought of the funeral of the old countess at that moment somebody in the street looked in at his window and immediately passed on again herman paid no attention to this incident a few moments afterwards he heard the door of his ante-room open herman thought that it was his orderly drunk as usual returning from some nocturnal expedition but presently he heard footsteps that were unknown to him somebody was walking softly over the floor in slippers 
the door opened and a woman dressed in white entered the room herman mistook her for his old nurse and wondered what could bring her there at that hour of the night but the white woman glided rapidly across the room and stood before him and herman recognized the countess i have come to you against my wish she said in a firm voice but i have been ordered to grant your request three seven ace will win for you if played in succession but only on these conditions that you do not play more than one card in twenty-four hours and you never play again during the rest of your life i forgive you my death on condition that you marry my companion lizaveta ivanovna with these words she turned around very quietly walked with a shuffling gait towards the door and disappeared herman heard the street door open and shut and again he saw someone looking at him through the window for a long time herman could not recover himself he then rose up and entered the room his orderly was lying asleep upon the floor and he had much difficulty in waking him the orderly was drunk as usual and no information could be obtained from him the street door was locked herman returned to his room lit his candle and wrote down all the details of his vision six two fixed ideas can no more exist together in the moral world than two bodies can occupy one in the same place in the physical world three seven ace soon drove out of herman's mind the thought of the dead countess three seven ace were perpetually running through his head and continually being repeated by his lips if he saw a young girl he would say how slender she is quite like the three of hearts if anybody asked what is the time he would reply five minutes to seven every stout man that he saw reminded him of the ace three seven ace haunted him in his sleep and assumed all possible shapes the threes bloomed before in the forms of magnificent flowers the sevens were represented by gothic portals and the aces became transformed into gigantic spiders one thought alone occupied his whole mind to make a profitable use of the secret which he had purchased so dearly he thought of applying for a furlough so as to travel abroad he wanted to go to paris and tempt fortune in some of the public gambling houses that abounded there chance spared him all this trouble there was in moscow a society of rich gamesters presided over by the celebrated chekolinsky who had passed all his life at the card table and had massed millions accepting bills of exchange for his winnings and paying his losses in ready money his long experience secured for him the confidence of his companions and his open house his famous cook and his agreeable and fascinating manners gained for him the respect of the public he came to st petersburg the young men of the capital flocked to his rooms for getting balls for cards and preferring the emotions of faro to the seductions of flirting narumov conducted herman to chekolinsky's residence they passed through a suite of magnificent rooms filled with attentive domestics the place was crowded generals and privy councillors were playing at whist young men were lolling carelessly upon the velvet-covered sofas eating ices and smoking pipes in the drawing-room at the head of a long table around which were assembled about a score of players sat the master of the house keeping his bank he was a man of about sixty years of age of a very dignified appearance his head was covered with silvery white hair his full florid countenance expressed a good nature and his eyes twinkled with a perpetual smile narumov introduced herman to him chekolinsky shook him by the hand in a friendly manner requesting him not to stand on ceremony and then went on dealing the game occupied some time on the table lay more than thirty cards chekolinsky paused after each throw in order to give the players time to arrange their cards and note down their losses listened politely to their requests and more politely still put straight the corners of cards that some players hands had chanced to bend at last the game was finished chekolinsky shuffled the cards and prepared to deal again will you allow me to take a card said herman stretching out his hand from behind a stout gentleman who was punting chekolinsky smiled and bowed silently as a sign of acquiescence narumov laughingly congratulated herman on his abjuration of that abstention from cards which he had practised for so long a period and wished him a lucky beginning stake said herman writing some figures with a chalk on the back of his card how much asked the baker contracting the muscles of his eyes excuse me i cannot see quite clearly forty-seven thousand roubles replied herman at these words every head in the room turned suddenly around and all eyes were fixed on herman he's taken leave of his senses thought narumov allow me to inform you said chekolinsky with his eternal smile that you are playing very high nobody here has ever staked more than two hundred and seventy-five roubles at once very well replied herman but you accept my card or not chekolinsky bowed in token of consent i only wish to observe said he that although i have the greatest confidence in my friends i can only play against ready money for my own part i am quite convinced that your word is sufficient but for the sake of the order of the game and to facilitate the reckoning up i must ask you to put the money on your card herman drew from his pocket a banknote and handed it to chekolinsky who after examining it in a cursory manner placed it on herman's card he began to deal on the right a nine turned up and on the left a three 
i have won said herman showing his card a murmur of astonishment rose among the players chekolinsky frowned but the smile quickly returned to his face do you wish me to settle with you he said to herman if you please replied the latter chekolinsky drew from his pocket a number of banknotes and paid at once herman took up his money and left the table narumov could not recover from his astonishment herman drank a glass of lemonade and returned home the next evening he again repaired to chekolinsky's the host was dealing herman walked up to the table the punters immediately made room for him chekolinsky greeted him with a gracious bow herman waited for the next deal took a card and placed upon it his forty-seven thousand roubles together with his winnings of the previous evening chekolinsky began to deal a knave turned up on the right a seven on the left herman showed his seven there was a general exclamation chekolinsky was evidently ill at ease but he counted out the ninety-four thousand roubles and handed them over to herman pocketed them in the coolest manner possible and immediately left the house the next evening herman appeared again at the table every one was expecting him the generals and the privy councillors left their whist in order to watch such extraordinary play the young officers quitted their sofas and even the servants crowded into the room all pressed around herman the other players left off punting impatient to see how it would end herman stood at the table and prepared to play alone against the pale but still smiling chekolinsky each opened a pack of cards chekolinsky shuffled herman took a card and covered it with a pile of banknotes it was like a duel deep silence reigned around chekolinsky began to deal his hands trembled on the right a queen turned up and on the left an ace ace has won cried herman showing his card your queen has lost said chekolinsky politely herman started instead of an ace there lay before him the queen of spades he could not believe his eyes nor could he understand how he had made such a mistake at that moment it seemed to him that the queen of spades smiled ironically and winked her eye at him he was struck by her remarkable resemblance the old countess he exclaimed seized with terror chekolinsky gathered up his winnings for some time herman remained perfectly motionless when at last he left the table there was a general commotion in the room splendidly punted said the players chekolinsky shuffled the cards afresh and the game went on as usual herman went out of his mind and is now confined in room number seventeen of the apokov hospital he never answers any questions but he constantly mutters with usual rapidity three seven ace three seven queen lizaveta ivanovna has married a very amiable young man a son of the former steward of the old countess he is in the service of the state somewhere and is in receipt of a good income lizaveta is also supporting a poor relative tomsky has been promoted to the rank of captain and has become the husband of the princess pauline End of the Queen of Spades by Alexander Pushkin, Part 2